um, if I could. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Jeff. Hello to everybody. Yes, yeah, so my name is Simon Bainbridge. I'm a professor of Romantic Studies at Lancaster University. I'm also a trustee of the Wordsworth Trust. Um, a lot of my research is focused on the figure of Wordsworth and uh, his contemporaries. So I've written things on Wordsworth and Napoleon and Wordsworth and the Revolutionary Napoleonic Wars and just finished a project on um, the Romantics and Mountaineering. Uh, I'm also known to some of the people in the audience as um, the lead educator for the online course we've been running recently on William Wordsworth Poetry, People and Place. Uh, so it's very nice that um, some of you have been able to join us uh, today. Part of the conception of this sequence of events was that um, uh, these online meetings would give us a chance to discuss some of the topics we've been thinking about over the past six weeks, uh, past four weeks, sorry, uh, with the speakers who are joining us over the next uh, six weeks. I should also mention that um, uh, Jonathan Bates, who Jeff will introduce formally in just a moment, has been a, a key figure really in the world of online courses. He launched a pioneering course called Shakespeare and His World, um, which is one of the first literary courses on FutureLearn uh, and uh, was a fantastic model for lots of the courses that have followed, uh, including ours. So um, it's very nice to, um, uh, to be able to introduce some of, some of our learners to uh, Professor Bates, who's been so important for this form of learning. And, it, and what, a, what a success it was, wasn't it, Simon? One of the most enjoyable things that, that we do. Um, is that, and of course, welcome Jonathan, I'll, I'll formally introduce you in, in just a moment. Um, we'd very much like comments. Um, Hannah started off in a really good way, so please add your comments as we go. Clearly many of you know exactly how to do that. Uh, if you don't, it's you look below our faces, you, you go for the more button, you'll find chat, and you can address them either to us as panelists or to everybody as, as attendees. Um, we'll try to respond to the points as we go. Um, apologies if we don't pick up every point. And we're recording the webinar. Um, I hope that's okay with everybody. It'll only be our four faces that get recorded. Um, that's right, Hannah, isn't it? So right. if other people don't need to, to feel that they're, they're being recorded if, if it's against their wishes. Um, it's the first of a series of six events, uh, Wordsworthian themes, as you'll have seen if, you, if you've seen them. And what we hope to do, of course, is to encourage reading and, and rereading of the literature, uh, hopefully with fresh insights and understandings, but also to think, well, what does the literature offer us today? Uh, that, that's as important. And the format for this evening will be Simon and I talking with Jonathan for the first half. We'll have a short break and then really exciting part of the evening, we'll come back and Jonathan will talk about an object of his choice. He's chosen something from the collection that he wishes to, to talk about and, and uh, share his love for. And then after that, we'll have some more questions and then end with a, a reading from the book and then hopefully finish by nine o'clock. So I hope that's what everybody's expecting. Um, so to introduce uh, our, our speaker, we're really privileged to start this series uh, with Professor Sir, Sir Jonathan Bate. He's a, a well-known critic, biographer, broadcaster, scholar. He's Foundation Professor of Environmental Humanities at Arizona State University and a Senior Research Fellow at Worcester College, Oxford, where he was the provost between 2011 and 19. And he, he told us just before you might have heard that what we, you're saying that you were hoping the temperature might dip below 100, I think, tomorrow. I, <laughs> I speak from a wet, dark grass mirror, so <laughs> I kind of partly envy, <laughs> partly envy you there. Um, in 2006, he was awarded a CBE uh, in the Queen's 80th Birthday Honours for his services to higher education. Uh, he's been Vice President, Leading Humanities of the British Academy. And then wonderfully in January 2015, he became the youngest person ever to have been knighted for services to literary scholarship, which is a great, a great thing. As for this year, 250th anniversary of Wordsworth, Wordsworth's birthday, uh, he published this book. Um, and that, of course, is the main topic for our conversation this evening. And uh, it, it's no small volume, but it, it's, <laughs> we, Simon and I have really, really enjoyed reading it and, and talking about it. Um, what, what I love particularly is the variety in the book. I love the variety of the stories, the compelling stories that are wonderfully told, whether that's how in, in really, you know, almost day by day detail, how the Home Office sent spies down to Somerset to watch on the Wordsworths, or how you've pieced together um, the, the, the narrative of 1802 with William and Mary's marriage and from the scant evidence that you could find in the journals. Um, it, it really is, 
it's, it's fascinating reading. Um, then there's the analysis, of course, and deep insights into the poems and, and the making of really complex subjects accessible. Uh, I really felt that I came to terms with a lot of things that you know, I've struggled with, as it were, over the years. And it's also a history of ideas. If you want to learn about German Romanticism, you'll get that from this book. If you want to know about the history of guidebooks of the Lake District, you'll get that from this book too. So as well as the biography of Wordsworth, it's a wonderful introduction to Romanticism generally. And uh, of course, as the other part of the title says, it is the man who, who changed the world. So that, that you get as well. So if I may say congratulations, it's, it's just such a really enjoyable book to read. Um, but the, the, the question, I guess the first question, which might be an obvious one, um, is it's not the first biography of Wordsworth. Uh, what inspired you to, to write this one? Well, thank you. Thank you, Jeff, for, for that introduction. And hello, Simon. And hello, everybody. Thank you so much for, for joining us um, on this. Uh, I'm only sorry we're not doing it in person, but the time will come. So I'm sitting here in my home in Scottsdale, Arizona, looking out on a very beautiful mountain, but a rather brown, dry mountain, as opposed to a beautiful green lake district one. <laughs> A great question, though, as to why I wrote this book. I mean, there are plenty of good biographies of Wordsworth out there. Back in the 20th century, Mary Mormon wrote a wonderful biography in two volumes, and that has stood up terrifically well. Um, then Stephen Gill wrote one, which he's recently revised, and, and there have been others. Um, Juliet Barker, Kenneth Johnston, big thousand-page books. Um, it wasn't originally going to be a biography. Um, my original plan was to write a book introducing uh, the main figures of the Romantic movement in Britain with some sense also of the European context. Um, so it was gonna be a group biography of the Romantics. And I started on this quite a few years ago, but I really found it difficult to give it a structure. Group biography is a very difficult thing to do because unless your book's gonna be absolutely enormous, you have to be highly selective. But then came a point which I thought the way to focus it is in particular moments and particular meetings. For example, the moment uh, in the early 1790s when Wordsworth is in Paris, as are various other British radicals, the poet Helen Murray Williams, the philosopher Walking Stewart. Then the moment when Coleridge, Wordsworth, and Dorothy are together in the West Country and Hazlitt visits them. Then the moment during the Regency period where Benjamin Robert Hayden um, has this amazing dinner party in Wordsworth and Keats are there. And I thought, yes, this is, a, this is a way to structure it. But the book still seemed too fragmentary. And then I suddenly realized the person who was present at all those moments was Wordsworth. And so I thought, yes, that's the way to structure it to make it a biography of Wordsworth, structured by moments, by, in his term, spots of time, but using those moments and relationships and encounters as a way of introducing the wider themes of the Romantic periods. Things like the history of picturesque tourism, the influence of German idealist philosophy, and of course, the influence of the French Revolution Rousseau, all the new ideas of the period. So that was really how the book evolved. Um, I then, of course, had the problem that the difficulty with biographies of Wordsworth is that the second half of his life, once he moves away from Grasmere down to Rydal Mount, takes up residence, becomes um, a country gentleman in many respects, um, the second half of the life is much less interesting than the first half. And in my view, the poetry of the second half is much less powerful than the poetry of the first half. So then I had the kind of structural problem, how to deal with that. I didn't really want to go over the whole of the life. So that was when I had this idea of sort of pivoting the second half of the book towards more of a history of Wordsworth's influence. Um, the influence both positive and negative on the younger romantics such as Shelley and Byron and then his extraordinary influence on Victorian culture, the way that for figures such as the great thinkers, John Stuart Mill and John Ruskin, Wordsworth was a, a formative influence on their thought. And then the book moves towards the moment to at the end of the Victorian period where the Wordsworth Trust is established and the National Trust is established under the influence of Wordsworth. So it sort of became a, a cultural history from the origins of Romanticism with Ossian and Rousseau and Chatterton back in the 1760s through to the 1890s and the beginnings of the Wordsworth Trust, but with the focus very much on that great decade 
when Wordsworth and Coleridge are doing their best work. So it's, so it's no accident, as it were, that it does read like a history of romanticism, um, because I can see why, yeah, that was, that was part of your original thought. Sorry, Simon. I was just going to say, I mean, that's a, a, a fascinating account. Thank you very much, uh, Jonathan, because it really uh, captures for me um, to what were two of the great qualities I thought of the book and like like Jeff I thoroughly enjoyed it and I would um, fully recommend it to um, uh, to everyone in the audience I mean one of the elements of the book which I really liked is as you say you've got a cast of characters haven't you so let's focus on Wordsworth you know we learn a lot about Coleridge particularly uh, but a number of other people throughout so there's a really strong um, element of the book there I thought and then also as you say some marvellous set pieces many of which you've mentioned I mean I particularly enjoyed the the immortal dinner uh, and the way in which you you describe that, um, but it's it also struck me that one of the distinguishing features of this as a biography is the focus you put on the literature. Um, I mean, Mary Mormon, you mentioned uh, earlier, a fantastic biography, but by comparison, very heavily reliant it seems to me on the letters. Um, whereas for you, um, the biography seems. I mean, well, for me as a reader, it really conveyed the power of words with poetry, and you can feel. Um, you know, your, your training, if you like, as a literary critic and uh, also as a, a sort of writer of fiction coming, coming through there, um, I thought. But I wanted to ask you quite early on, you, 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 you use the interesting uh, statement that you say uh, a Wordsworthian biography of Wordsworth will be more like a stream of consciousness uh, than a march from cradle to grave. And I wondered if you could say a bit more about that sense that through this uh, sort of evolutionary process you've talked about how you've ended up actually with a with a format that echoes Wordsworth's own uh, format. Yeah, I mean that was very much the idea. I mean I um, absolutely agree with um, uh, what you're, you're saying that compared with many other biographers, I do give more space to the poetry because um, you know there's a, there's a funny way in which um, precisely because. The Prelude is the first great autobiographical epic. There has been a tendency in academic studies in the last 20 or 30 years to be a little bit suspicious of the, the idea that the, the Prelude is, is in any sense a kind of transparent telling of Wordsworth's life. Um, now, it, it seems to me Wordsworth himself is eminently aware of that. There are these fascinating moments in the Prelude where he says, Am I remembering something from childhood? Did I feel like that then? Or is the very act of remembering it somehow creating the feeling? And this actually chimes with what modern neurological researchers tell us about the way memory works. But having said that, it was really important to me for the book to be a kind of inner life of Wordsworth. In, in many ways, the, the other inspiration behind it was my previous biography, um, which was the biography of Ted Hughes, who I read very much as a, as a Wordsworthian poet, a poet obsessed with Wordsworth. And the working title of that book was very much an inner life because I had the privilege of reading all Hughes's manuscript drafts of his poems and his unpublished journal entries. And in that book, I really tried to sort of get under the skin of Ted Hughes to, to write as if from his point of view, rather than from the point of view of the kind of externals that you get from letters, public reputation, reviews, and so on. So I felt I wanted to do something, something similar for Wordsworth, um, really to sort of take, take it on faith, take it at face value that the things he chooses to write about in his autobiographical poems are the things that were most important in the growth of the poet's mind, the shaping of his identity. Thank you, I mean, that, that's fascinating. I've got uh, an interesting question which has come from, from the audience here, actually, which I think follows up on that very nicely. Um, and I'll read it out in just a second, but just uh, for anyone who's unfamiliar with the, the, the concept, which you've already mentioned of spots of time, um, this is the idea Wordsworth introduces in the prelude that there are these key formative moments in, in, our, in our lives. And the, the early versions of the prelude particularly very much structured around these, these spots of time. But I've got a question here from Peter Shaw, which I'll, I'll read out. Um, so Peter says, uh, you write in radical Wordsworth, the Wordsworth's life, as with any life, is, quote, shaped more by key moments than quotidian routine, unquote. And you reference this concept of key moments to his own idea of spots of time. Do you think it is part of the role of a biographer 
to try and identify spots of time, the significance of which the subject of the biography may not have been aware. If so, can you give a couple of examples of what you see as words with spots of time that he doesn't seem to have fully recognized himself? That's a really, really great question. Um, just taking it in two parts, because um, as Wordsworth says, and as Simon has said, uh, Wordsworth says it's primarily spots of time from childhood that he believes form the self. Now there, it's pretty difficult to speculate about spots of time that he didn't recognize as such, because how could you know what they were? Because there's no kind of external evidence about them. Um, so I, I think the, the childhood ones, you have to take at face value. These are the moments in my childhood that I remember. Um, having said that, one of the most famous of those spots of time um, has this little bit of kind of evasion that uh, the thing that he's really remembering or trying not to remember in a way is the death of his father. But the way that he describes that is not actually the moment of the deathbed or the funeral, but it's the moment when he's waiting for the horses to take him home for the Christmas vacation in which his father dies and he sort of slightly sublimates, I'm using a Freudian term there, and I did, I did, I did find in all sorts of ways Wordsworth seems to anticipate Sigmund Freud's sort of theories of memory and childhood development. So there are, there are these kind of slightly displaced moments and I think they're the interesting ones. And that is perhaps where um, the idea of a really important moment that he doesn't quite um, come to explicitly, um, that, that seems to me, a, 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 of a way to answer this question. And to pick a couple of those in particular, um, one I got very interested in is um, this moment when he's left the Lake District, gone over to Yorkshire, he's um, proposing marriage, he's gonna propose marriage to, to Mary Hutchinson. Um, and then sort of on the way back, he sees this glow worm and he writes this poem to the glow worm. Um, and it's, it, it's rather fascinating because um, in one respect, it seems to be a kind of love poem to his sister Dorothy. In another respect, it's a love poem to Mary, whom he's about to marry. And of course, Dorothy um, was very upset. I mean, I'm, I don't go down the route that there was some kind of dodgy sexual relationship between them at all, but there, there was an incredibly intense bond between them. And for Dorothy, it was a moment of trauma when Mary became you know, the third person um, in in the household. So that glow worm poem I see as a, as a kind of displaced spot of time. And then of course the other one, the, um, you know, the biggest spot of time surely uh, for, for so many of us in, in, in our lives is when we fall passionately in love for the first time. I mean, I'm sure we all remember that moment you know, when we were young, we were, whether it was 17, 19, 21, oh my God, I've fallen in love, the whole world seems different and new. Wordsworth never writes directly about falling in love with Annette Vermont, but clearly he did fall in love with her. But then because um, of the illegitimate child, the fact they weren't married, the fact she was French, he could never write about that overtly. What he does is write about it sort of indirectly in this story he puts in the prelude called Vaudricourt and Julia, his kind of Romeo and Juliet story. But even there, um, there isn't a sort of, you know, a dazzling moment of you know, I saw her, I fell in love, or we kissed for the first time. So that, that I think, is the, the big evasion. Fantastic. Thanks very much, Jonathan. And um, thanks to Peter for sending in that question, too. So if other people have questions which uh, they'd like us to put to Jonathan, in, particularly in the second half of this uh, session, then do please send them in via the chat, and Hannah will, will monitor them. I'm going to hand back over to Jeff now. Thank you. Um, just, think, again, thinking about the, the title of the book, Jonathan, that there's, uh, in the uh, museum that used to be, um, there was a wall full of portraits of Wordsworth and they were all of the older Wordsworth. They were, of, you know, the Victorian Wordsworth. And it would surprise people perhaps if that's how they pictured the man, that there was a radical younger self. Um, I wonder if you could say a bit more about that, please, where, where the title of the book Radical Wordsworth comes from. Well enough, it didn't come from me, it came from my publisher. Um, I was going to call the book, The Poet Who Changed the World, yeah. and subtitle it, um, William Wordsworth and the Romantic Revolution. Um, but uh, my publisher, Arabella Pike, is, is a great publisher. She, she said, um, I think The Poet Who Changed the World uh, is better as a subtitle because if it was the main title, people wouldn't necessarily know who it was. You've got to have Wordsworth in the main title. And she said, what about Radical Wordsworth? 
And I said, yeah, that, that's fantastic. Um, uh, because the emphasis in the book is so much on those early radical years, as opposed to conservative Wordsworth, the, the older poet. Um, but also what I liked about the title was the meaning of radical um, was undergoing something of a change in Wordsworth's time. That the, the, the association of the word radical with political radicalism only emerged with the French Revolution. The original meaning of radical means getting to the roots, comes from the Latin word radix, meaning a root. And I thought, yes, this is what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to get to the roots of Wordsworth's genius. And he was at his rootedness in the Lake District, in landscape. Wordsworth as a poet of roots, of place, of environment, but also the political Wordsworth. So radical Wordsworth seemed absolutely right from that point of view. The, and the thought about the subtitle, which as I say was the original title, really went back to meditating on W.H. Auden's great poem written on the death of the poet W.B. Yeats, where uh, he begins the poem by saying, poetry makes nothing happen. But by the end of the poem, he says poetry is a way of happening, a mouth. He speaks of how the words of the dead poet are modified in the guts of the living. And it seemed to me Wordsworth is the great poet who does make a difference. Wordsworth's poetry made things happen. It made John Stuart Mill recover from his depression. It made Canon Rawnsley participate in the founding of the National Trust. It made everybody think about childhood and memory in new ways. So when I read it, I, I thought of the political radicalism and then of course reading it too, of course there's the, there's the originality of the poetry and, and the ideas. Um, and this word about the romantic revolution, which you, you, you use, clearly it was a break, but one of the fascinating things, again, I think uh, I really enjoyed in your book was where you draw that distinction between the enlightenment romanticism, how it, they weren't, so completely separate, one fed to the other, but it was a revolution nonetheless. I wonder if you could just say a little bit more about that, if you would, please. Yeah, no, I think that's a, that's a really important point that, you know, 20th century literary history tended to set up a very strong opposition between a classical or enlightenment period in the 18th century, a romantic period beginning around the time of the French Revolution. But in fact, there are, there are great continuities. I talk quite a lot in the book about Wordsworth's admiration for the poet William Cooper, whose The Task, a long blank verse poem, um, uses a lot of kind of Wordsworthian, what we think of as Wordsworthian techniques of blank verse, run on lines, meditation on nature. Similarly, some of the um, Enlightenment philosophers uh, developed many of the ideas about memory, sense impression, and imagination that are very, very much crucial to Wordsworth and Coleridge. Um, I have a section in the book where I, I, I suggest um, uh, some a, a work by an Enlightenment philosopher called Lord Kames um, as a major influence on Wordsworth's sort of theory of how we perceive the world around us. Equally, some of the, uh, the, the, the other poets of the later 18th century, such as the poet Thomas Chatterton, uh, who wrote in a kind of medieval style, um, and indeed the poetry of the literary magazines of the time often include poems about the poor. You know, it's sometimes said lyrical ballads, the first volume to give a voice to the poor, the marginalized. It's not strictly true. Uh, others were doing it. But what was new about Wordsworth was the way that he did it in terms of the relationship between his own self and the people he's writing about. That, um, there's a, a sort of sense of a dialogue between Wordsworth and the female vagrant or the discharged soldier or the shepherd with the last of his flock, um, or Wordsworth sort of ironizing himself, the dialogue with the child in the poem, We Are Seven. That I think is the thing that is uniquely innovative. That's great, thank you, thank you, Simon. Uh, I, I mean, as you might expect, I was very, I was convinced, Jonathan, by your claim about Wordsworth as the poet who changed the world. I mean, as you say, much of the second half of the book is is devoted to that, as as in your account, sort of Wordsworth's career is is now going down from the summit of the mountain. At the same time, his influence is becoming uh, all the more striking. And it's particularly interesting the way in which you gave that a global twist. I thought tracing it across to um, 
uh, to America and the, the claim that the, uh, the national parks in America were, were Wordsworth's best idea, which was a very striking argument. Um, I'm sure a number of uh, the attendees in, um, in today's session have also listened to your radio programme uh, in the footsteps of, of Wordsworth. And if they haven't, it's still there on the Sounds app, just go into the BBC Sounds app, type Wordsworth. It's the first thing that, that comes up and a fascinating hour and a half of you on location, on sort of Wordsworth in locations. And you, you begin the book as well um, on location, um, recalling first going to the Lake District for a family holiday uh, and the photograph there. So it almost like a, it feels like a spot of time uh, in your own life. And then visiting Dove Cottage a few miles down the road in Grasmere. You say, that was my introduction to William Wordsworth. I was amazed that anyone could live and write in rooms so small and dark. Uh, and indeed, you know, it's a very striking uh, point that the fantastic manuscripts, uh, many of which are, are works of art held at the, uh, the Jerwood Centre at Wordsworth Grasmere were produced in those conditions. But I wanted to ask you more generally about this sense of, as a biographer, following in the footsteps of your subject and how important that is to really getting a sense of you know Wordsworth in particular but the person you're writing about in general. Mm. Yeah that's that's a great question to me it's it's really important and for me what this goes back to is um, the, the first time I read a biography that really excited me. Funny, I, I was uh, I'm very old now so I, I was taught in the tradition of uh, uh, I had school teachers you know, who'd been taught by F.R. Leavis in the traditions of close reading. And the mantra I learned at school, and indeed to some extent at university, was you pay attention to the text, not the author, not the biography. The text is the self-contained thing. We close read the text. We think about the reader in the text. We don't think about biographical origins. But then I read Richard Holmes's biography of Shelley. And of all the romantics, Shelley was the one that I, I most struggled with the text. It didn't somehow speak to me in the way that Wordsworth and Coleridge and Keats and, and Byron and John Clare did. Um, but Holmes just totally brought Shelley alive. And the way that he did it was through footstepping. Um, he just followed in Shelley's footsteps. Um, and that just made for an incredible read. It was a um, biography as a kind of adventure. And that was really what made me think, yeah, biography can be a fantastic way of getting inside the head of a writer that you're interested in. But to get inside the head, you have to follow the feet. Um, and so it was when I wrote my first biography of, of, of John Clare, uh, who came from the Eastern Lowlands, the Fenlands of East Anglia. Um, it was very, very important to, to go to Clare's village to see how the second village he moved to was a little further into the Fens, then to retrace his footsteps when he walked out of the asylum back home. Um, similarly, working on Ted Hughes, I had the privilege um, of writing the chapter about his childhood in the very house he was brought up in because it's now available for holiday lets. <laughs> So that, that to me was, uh, was, was, was kind of a crucial part of the process. And for Wordsworth, as, as you say, I sort of got into Wordsworth on family holidays in the Lake District, you know, hiking, um, also love of the West Country, which was so important to Wordsworth. Um, so it was important to me to revisit those places, but also to visit one or two places I hadn't been to before. So, for example, in the radio series, we found the house called Racedown um, in Somerset, which was where Coleridge and, uh, and, and Wordsworth began their great uh, poetic collaboration. And I was able actually to go to this gate that Coleridge jumped over. He jumped over a gate and cut across a field. He was so excited to meet Wordsworth and read poetry with him. I found it was a, a rather unpleasant modern metal gate, uh, but it was the original site of the gate. And I did jump over it and trespass onto the field because Race Down, alas, um, unlike Nether Stowey, is not open to the public. And the other fantastic experience making those programs uh, was going to Alfoxton, um, the house that Wordsworth and Dorothy rented close to Nether Stowey, where Coleridge lived, um, and where so many of the greatest poems were written. Um, and I had this extraordinary experience there. It really was a spot of time, because the, the, the big house was derelict, but the old stable block had been renovated, um, and a family were living there with children playing. So as I went up to Alfoxton, 
just heard these voices of children playing. And it was as if Word Wordsworth's own family was there. Because one of the things I got fascinated by the whole idea of Wordsworth and family was this was the period when he adopted this little boy, Basil Montague. Um, and uh, Basil plays an important role in, in, in some of the poems. And that was a truly magical moment. But I'm delighted to see that our Foxton house has recently um, been purchased um, and is going, to, is going to be restored. So uh, one hopes that that will become a pilgrimage, uh, although not, a, of course, a place to take people away from Dove Cottage. <laughs> that, you, you talk about your sort of early introductions to, to Wordsworth there. There's, there's a nice question from Susan Partridge who, who says that uh, she's a newcomer um, and she's asking, where should she start? Do you have a favorite Wordsworth poem? Well, my favourite Wordsworth poem is his great meditation lines written a few miles above Tintin Abbey. I would say don't read that one first. I think the, the way to begin is with some of the shorter poems, um, and perhaps in particular, this extraordinary group of mysterious poems that he wrote when he and Coleridge spent a winter in Germany. Um, they're grouped together as the Lucy poems. We don't know whether there really was a girl called Lucy that he once loved and lost, or whether he's, as Coleridge said, imagining what it would be like if his beloved sister Dorothy died, or whether he's just inventing it. But as poems um, about strong feeling, uh, love and loss, great words birthing themes, you can't do better than start with, a slumber did my spirit seal, I had no human fears. She seemed a thing that would not feel the touch of earthly years. No motion has she now, no force. She neither hears nor sees. Rolled round in earth's diurnal course with rocks and stones and trees. Having read those Lucy poems, I think one could then go on to Tintin Abbey, this great meditation that he writes when he travels up the Wye Valley, revisiting it um, and reflects on memory, on life, on love, and above all, on the relationship between humankind and nature. And um, retracing his steps um, up the Wye Valley was at, uh, for the radio programs was an important part of my journey because um, it convinced me that uh, the small minority of scholars who have argued that Tintin Abbey was not written that close to the ruin of Tintin Abbey itself were correct. Because he talks a lot about the steep and lofty cliffs, the sounding cataract, the river not being tidal. And it's actually several miles to the north of, hence above Tintin Abbey, that, that that is the case. And I came to the conclusion that actually it was another picturesque tourist spot a little further up the Wye Valley, Simmons Yat, was the place where he was really inspired to write the poem. So that was another good example of um, the, the way that footstepping can really give insight, even though so much has changed in the landscapes of the last 200 years. I, I must say, I've, I've always been, a, as it were, a lover of the blank verse and the sonnet and, and the Lucy poems I, I, I'd never really come to terms with, but, but reading your, your book and reading that poem in particular and your analysis of it, I found very moving. So, so just to so. mention one other, you mentioned the sonnets, and I, I, th I think you're right. That would be the other great starting point. Um, the, for, for example, the you know the, the famous sonnet composed up, upon Westminster Bridge, um, which somehow um, seems to have spoken to many many people during lockdown, because uh, you know we the, the point of that poem is it's written very very early in the morning before the city is busy. This is when Wordsworth and Dorothy are about to set off for him to go back to France, to Calais, where he's going to meet his 10-year-old daughter for the first time, and he's going to have a little awkward conversation with Annette Vallon saying, uh, I'm about to marry someone else. Um, but as they're crossing Westminster Bridge, he looks at the, the silent city um, and writes, Earth hath not anything to show more fair. Never felt, he says, you know, a calm so deep. And um, as we've gone through this strange experience of, you know, hearing birdsong in the city, somehow that sonnet has spoken. The other great sonnet, um, is one of the few rather later poems that I think genuinely have stood the test of time. And that is the poem that he wrote after this tragic occurrence of two of his young children dying within a matter of months. And he writes this sonnet, C.S. Lewis loved it, didn't he? Surprised by joy, I turned to share the transport. 
but who with whom? So the idea that you're, you're out walking and you're surprised by joy, you see a flower, a beautiful view, bird song, whatever it is, and you want to share that transport and you turn to share it with the child you're walking with, but she's not there, she's dead. And then you feel guilty that you had the experience of joy because you should still be grieving. You have to learn that even in grief, we have to, to move on. Wordsworth is the great poet of, of coping with, with grief and with loss. And I, I think that's why, um, you know, in a way, you know, great shame it has been that for the 250th anniversary, there couldn't be a great reopening of Dove Cottage, a great celebration. But in some ways, it, it was timely that um, we started remembering Wordsworth at a time of great grief, of loss, of change, of sorrow, and of loneliness, because his poetry can provide such comfort at such a time. We will grieve not, rather find strength in what remains behind, he says, doesn't he? Yeah. I, I, as, as Jeff's indicated, I mean, I too found those very powerful parts of parts of the book. And again, you know, when I was talking earlier about sort of literary biography, which brought the poems to life. I mean, those those poems you focus on, um, and as you say, surprised by joy, great, great parts of the book. You do mention Dove Cottage there, and given that this um, uh, event is being hosted by Wordsworth Grasmere, I just wanted to get your sense of how important um, Dove Cottage and the surrounding area was for Wordsworth. Obviously, that's something that the, the learners who from the, who've joined us from the online course, that's something we've been thinking about um, a lot there. And you, you say near the start of part two of the book, you say, um, very interestingly, in order to write at his best, Wordsworth needed not only to have Dorothy and Coleridge by his side, he also needed to feel at home. So I just wondered if you could say a bit more about your sense of what feeling at home was for Wordsworth and how that links to the specific location and locale of Dove Cottage and Grasmere. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the sort of key poem exploring this is the, the poem that he called Home at Grasmere, which he intended to include in this great epic cycle, The Recluse, which he never got around to completing. But, you know, the, the old joke among Wordsworthians is he wrote a prelude to it and, a, and an excursion from it, but not the thing itself. Um, but the recluse, book one, part one, was going to be called Home at Grasmere, and it was going to be about the move to Grasmere, um, beginning with a memory of uh, returning to the Lake District. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I think the kind of intimacy that Dove Cottage provided um, was uh, incredibly important for his creativity. Um, and indeed, you know, he had begun, you know, we have, what we have to remember about Wordsworth is he was not only an orphan, but he was in many respects homeless for so long. Um, you know, his mother dies, when he's, he's eight, his father, um, when, when, when he's 13, he, he's happy at school because um, Anne Tyler becomes a, a kind of surrogate mother and he has a community there in Hawkshead. Cambridge, you know, a university is always a community, well, except at the moment. Um, but then after that, you know, for several years, he's a wanderer. He really is of no fixed abode. He begins to find a sense of home, uh, first at Racetown and then at Alfoxton. This is when he's reunited with Dorothy friendship with Coleridge begins, but those are rented properties where he's always aware that he could be chucked out within a year as, as he was. Dove Cottage, um, they, they knew they were able to take a, take a longer lease on it. Um, and it was a home. It was the first time he had a proper home back in the Lake District. But then of course, as the family grew, um, it proved too cramped. So they moved to this other house, Allen Bank. Um, but it's very striking that he, he found it really difficult to write poetry in Allen Bank. The chimney smoked, the house was drafty. And although Allen Bank does have this beautiful view out towards Lake Grasmere, um, somehow it didn't feel like a home. Um, so then, you know, he, 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 he moved on again. They had a short period actually uh, renting the, the, the old vicarage, didn't they? Um, but Rydal Mount uh, from 1813 onwards, it almost became too much of a home that, uh, uh, that, that the, the sense there was a kind of ease there, a respectability about it. And uh, this does seem to be the, the point that he, he, he slightly sinks into the life of the country gentleman. So I think, you know, Dove Cottage is absolutely the, 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 the crucial time. I'm just could I just pick up on one question I've seen in the chat, which was a, which was a, an, a, an interesting one. Um, uh, 
a, quest, a question um, from Con Connor James at Ulster University, who's um, thinking about um, eco-feminism. The idea of something I started doing um, quite a long time ago, I, I, I wrote a book called Romantic Ecology, uh, looking at Wordsworth in the context of thinking about ecology and environment. Um, work of eco-criticism, as I called it there, back, back then in 1990. Um, eco-feminism, sort of thinking ecologically about literature, but also from a feminist point of view. And um, I think that's a, a, that's a very interesting approach in relation to Wordsworth, because I, I think for me, one of the sort of uh, the big discoveries of the book um, was how important women were for Wordsworth. Not just Dorothy. I mean, everybody knows Wordsworth was inspired by Dorothy. But I was very struck, for instance, by the way that Sarah Hutchinson, um, his sister-in-law, Coleridge's great love, she wrote poetry and advised Wordsworth on his poetry. Um, and of course, he was also inspired by other women poets. I have a chapter in the book called Two Revolutionary Women, pointing out that when he goes to France and participates in the, the early stages of the French Revolution, He's inspired there by the example of two female poets, Charlotte Smith, who's living in Brighton, he stays with her before crossing the channel, and she's written a kind of radical novel based in the revolution. And then he's given a letter of introduction to this very remarkable woman, Helen Maria Williams, fine poet, one of the first poets to inspire him, his earliest published poem uh, was inspired by reading her poetry. But she was also there as a kind of frontline reporter in Paris. He didn't actually meet her, she'd moved down to Orléans. He follows her down to Orléans. Again, he misses her, but Orléans gets him to meet Annette Vallon. So the women really important. And I think Dorothy's way of writing about nature was absolutely crucial for Wordsworth himself. Um, I talk a bit in the poem about a, a wonderful little sort of ecological poem um, that Dorothy writes herself, uh, where she, she observes a kind of piece of broken off earth um, on the surface of a lake and, it, 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 and how it becomes like a little ecosystem. And this is a point for me to make one confession. Um, I, I, when you write a big book like this, and you, particularly when you're pushed for time towards the end because the publisher wanted it out for the anniversary, um, sometimes you, you leave something in your notes and forget to put it in. And to my great shame, I forgot to move from my notes to the main text the fact that the two finest lines in his most famous poems, Daffodils, were actually the idea of Mary, his wife, not himself. So that's the one correction I'm going to make for the paperback. Which, which he himself does interestingly acknowledge, doesn't he? Words he acknowledges people. late in life, that's right. Yeah. 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 <laughs> it's almost the, uh, the Melvin Bragg programme, isn't it? When you get the little bit on the podcast, what, what do you wish you'd said uh, <laughs> in the programme that was on? This is a good spot, if that's okay, to take our five minute break. Um, what uh, a, a question to think about, perhaps, the attendees of the break. Um, Jonathan, in his book, says that after 1807, um, there were three, correct me if I'm wrong, but there were sort of three brilliant poems, three memorable poems, The Surprise by Joy, uh, there's the final sonnet in the Dunn the sonnet sequence, and then there's the extemporary fusion on the death of James Hogg. So my challenge to people listening, uh, if you know the, the poetry of words of after 1807, the poems that were composed after 1807, what would you suggest could join those three as words with later genius uh, or example of? So we'll take a, and enter in the chat box, we can discuss that, um, but we'll rejoin again in, in five minutes. So that's about 20, 20 past eight. And, Okay, see you, see you soon. So. So hello everyone, you've got five minutes to submit your questions. It's me, Hannah, taking over this webinar while everyone else gets a glass of water, um, except for me. So we've had some really lovely questions this evening. At 20 past eight, we will be moving on to the next discussion and Jeff will be bringing out some Wordsworthian words items from our collection in the Jowood Centre Reading Room at Dove Cottage in Grasmere. Um, Jeff is currently giving this webinar from about a mile down the road from me. 
um, so alas, I can't be in the room with some of the things you're going to see tonight, but they're pretty special. Um, after looking at those items, um, Jonathan will read a small section from his book, and then we will start answering some of the questions from the chat and also any questions we've missed um, that you've emailed to us uh, before the event started. We'll try and make sure we get to everybody, um, but we've had some really good questions. Uh, so don't be shy. Um, there's no such thing as a stupid question. Meanwhile, um, I've been over on Twitter sharing some of my favourite parts of the event. So if you do have Twitter and you'd like to join in, just tag Wordsworth Grasmere and I will see you. Um, it's been lovely to have all you here tonight and see some of your thoughts and ideas about what you're doing and uh, what it's been like to join in an online event, um, you know, from home. I think usually it's, it's such a pleasure to have you all because you're tuning in, not from home, but you're actually coming up to Grasmere to see us. And uh, I think, you know, there is something really special about being in the Lake District and seeing the mountains and reading the poems in the place that they were written. Um, and also coming into our Gerald Centre and, and getting up close and personal with some of the items we have. So hopefully we'll be able to see some of you in person next year. Um, for those of you who live abroad or can't make the journey, um, it's really wonderful to actually spend some time with you um, because I don't think we'd normally be able to see you. Um, so again, do use this opportunity to ask any questions that you want to ask, even just send your comments and your thoughts. Um, tell us about what it's like for you, uh, where you are as well. Um, I see Abby said on Twitter that it's a really gloomy autumn evening in Grasmere at the moment. Sorry, in Ambleside Abbey, just down the road from me, about four miles. It's pretty gloomy here too, um, but you can imagine the sheep outside in the fields and there's a little bit of drizzle. Um, not the same as, as the warmth of Arizona, but we're doing our best. So you've got a couple more minutes to send me any burning questions that you have. And then we will try to get what we can. Um, so don't be shy, um, you know, ask anything and we'll do our best. And uh, I will hand back over to everybody here as they return with their glasses of water. Or in this case, I think Jeff is returning with a pair of ice skates. Um, so I will vanish. Thank you very much, Hannah. Um, yes, I've returned with a pair of ice skates. Um, so I'm going to try and uh, sc share my screen. Um, let's see if I can do this. Um, the camera that I'm going to put on uh, can make you feel a little bit woozy because it sort of dips in and out of focus, just like that. But it will come good. And I hope you can see there, um, if I move this to the a pair of ice skates. You asked to talk about these, or you you rather you nominated these as a subject to talk about. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so just going back to uh, I think the thing Simon mentioned um, about the online Shakespeare course that that, that I did. Um, I'm we talked in the first half about uh, the importance of footsteps. Uh, as well as manuscripts and letters and diaries for getting inside a writer. I think objects can also be tremendously helpful and evocative. Um, I sort of first began uh, exploring this um, back in 2012, at the time of the, um, the London Olympics, when I was asked to curate uh, an exhibition at the British Museum about uh, how the world was perceived in Shakespeare's time. The idea was as the, as the world came to London for the Olympics, we, we did a, a, a wonderful exhibition about um, how the world 
was seen through objects in the time of Shakespeare, it's something Neil McGregor, the director of the British Museum, was very, very keen on. Remember, he did his history of the world in 100 objects. I was then asked by the Shakespeare Birthplace Trust to do something similar with the objects in their collections, um, exploring Shakespeare and his world through uh, the objects in the collection of the house where he was born. Um, and as Simon generously said, I think to some extent that inspired Lancaster University and Dove Cottage to, uh, to do something quite similar, making use of objects as a way of really bringing alive Wordsworth and his world. And I think nothing brings him alive more vividly um, than skates, because one of the great scenes in the prelude, one of the great spots of time, is when he describes being with his boyhood friends on the frozen lake of Esthwaite and Windermere, skating across the ice, the sort of the magical sort of sense of speed. And then this, this fantastic moment where he rocks back um, on the heels. Um, and you can just imagine then the, the skate digging into the ice, he slows down. And of course, on the ice, you have the marks, the, the crisscross marks of the skates. And at one point he speaks about cutting across the reflex of a star. So he's skating at night, there's a star in the sky, the stars reflected in the clear ice, but also the kind of star shape of the skate marks. And for Wordsworth, as he stops and then his head spins and the world and the, the mountains around him spin, it becomes this fantastic spot of time. And you know, the amazing thing about Dove Cottage and the, the museum, the Wordsworth Museum, is they've got two pairs of Wordsworth skates. Um, uh, this one, uh, the so-called bootless runners, uh, which for a long time were displayed in Dove Cottage itself. And then another pair, which I illustrate in the book, um, which are in the, in, in, in the museum. Now, I'm not the only person uh, to have been inspired um, by these skates. Um, the greatest, perhaps most words, words worthy and, um, of poets in my lifetime was, of course, Seamus Heaney. And he visited Dove Cottage and he saw these skates. He visited, I, th I think uh, it was probably an evening visit, maybe during one of the Wordsworth uh, conferences when the, the house is magically opened by candlelight in the evening. And he saw, saw a star through the window, heard a sound of scraping on the slate and then thought about these skates. And he wrote this, this poem. Um, it's in Seamus Heaney's uh, collection, District and Circle, Wordsworth Skates. Star in the window. Slate scrape, bird or branch, or the wet and scud of steel on placid ice. Not the bootless runners lying toppled in dust in a display case, their bindings perished, but the reel of them on frozen Windermere as he flashed from the clutch of earth along its curve and left it scored. To be honest, we could spend our remaining time just discussing the richness of that poem. It's echoing of Wordsworth's, we hissed along the polished ice. But the sense, the real of them, real like a cinema, real, but also real, punning on R-E-A-L, real, the real experience of skating. And he flashes, flash is a key Wordsworth word, there's flashes of inspiration, that's what happens in the spot of time and he left earth scored. Scored in the sense of like a, 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 a cricket scorer telling the score. He scores the details of our relationship with the earth around us, but also a sense that we are as humans scoring, marking, scoring, perhaps scarring the earth. And that raises all sorts of fascinating, complex ecological questions. So, so much um, can really be derived just from, from thinking about um, the, the, the way that memory lodges, not only in places and people, but also in objects. Well, as a, as a curator, of course, that speaks to me. Um, that's, that's our capital, as it were, in the objects. And I, and I was very struck in, in the book um, where you quote a letter from 1816 about that sense that, that objects have meanings, but they come from our imaginations. And, and that is the same. In, in all visits to museums, we, we add extra meaning from our own perspective. Uh, and if I may read it, uh, objects, and then quote, derive their influence, not from properties inherent in them, not from what they're actually in themselves, but from such as are bestowed upon them by the minds of those who are conversant with 
or affected by those objects. And I thought that that spoke really well. And I, and I guess it relates, doesn't it, to the to the pile of stones in Greenhead Gill, to which there's a, a story appertains, uh, and maybe the broken pot in in the ruined cottage and and the excursion. Um, to 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 most people, they're just a piece of broken pot. But if you know the story, um, you're you're, ri you're richer for it. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, just a bit picking up briefly on that, um, one of the other inspiring um, aspects of the, the radio series was the, uh, the, the interview I did with James Rebanks, um, mm -hmm. the Herdwick Shepherd, who, whose family have farmed Herdwick sheep in the lakes um, for, for, for so long, um, and um, just visiting him on his farm, um, you where he knew every every fold of the hill, every every brook, every every gill, every track and trace. Um, and you you sense when you when you meet a real shepherd like that, you completely understand Wordsworth's great shepherd poem, Michael, um, about the building of the sheepfold on Greenhead Gill. Um, and I, I was interested uh, in doing the research on the sort of the history of Wordsworth's reputation um, uh, that this became a, a kind of a, a, a tourist point. Visitors would want to go up Greenhead Gill, just as Wordsworth says in the poem, in order to find what was allegedly Michael's sheepfold. It probably wasn't Michael's sheepfold, actually, but, uh, but in the imagination it was. Well, it, later in the series, um, uh, Seiko Yashikawa is going to be talking to us exactly about that, about the pilgrimages to Wordsworth. In, in play. I, I'm really glad you've got her because that, that, that book is so good, so good. Yeah. So that, that's, that's something to look forward to, to later on. Um, Simon, sure. Yeah, thanks, thanks very much, Jeff. So um, I'm going to link one of the sort of themes that uh, were, came up repeatedly through the, through the course, Jonathan, uh, to one of the questions that we've had tonight. Um, so to try to sort of gloss for the question, um, first of all, um, one of the things our learners were very interested in was Wordsworth's treatment of um, the figures of the poor and the marginalized and the broken, um, who you write uh, very compellingly about in the book and who Wordsworth, of course, writes very powerfully about. Um, there was some um, discussion there of, you know, the extent to which Wordsworth could really understand these figures, whether he was entitled to write about them. Um, and, uh, and this has been nicely articulated by Elizabeth Walker, who sent in this this question tonight. So I'll just read out her, her question for you and then see how you respond. Um, so she says in his letter presenting Lyrical Ballads 1800 to Charles Fox. So it's perhaps worth just me just explaining that Lyrical Ballads, which included the poem Michael that you just talked about, um, was sent by Wordsworth to Charles James Fox, the leader of the opposition, the sort of Keir Starmer of his day, I guess. But um, in that letter, Wordsworth insists on three things. The value of domestic feeling, that humble people are capable of it, and that is it is under threat in all orders of society. He suggests that Lyrical Ballads is a call for the higher orders to think differently about the lower, to quote, consider the points in which they resemble us, unquote. Curiously, these political ideas do not recur in his 1802 preface. Uh, my question is whether Wordsworth was sincere in his social purpose at that time, or if, as his brother John commented, he was becoming a most accomplished courtier and merely tuning his message to promote his book. And then Elizabeth adds, sort of broadening the question, the broader question is about whether romanticism challenged the idea that social hierarchies are also sensibility hierarchies that those of the lower orders feel less or not at all. And then she asked, which we might come back to as a secondary question, how are romanticism and the anti-slavery movement related, um, which we can certainly <laughs> discuss. But on that, that first point, you know, your response to Wordsworth's treatment of these figures from the, the margins of society. Yeah. Well, if it's a good question, if we, if we stick with Michael to begin with, what, it, what, what he says about Michael is that he wrote it to show that people who do not wear fine clothes can feel deeply. Um, the language of that poem um, is uh, at, at various key points, I think, shaped by a memory of the language of Shakespeare's King Lear. Um, the whole idea of 
a father grieving for a child. And I think we need to remember that tragedy, traditionally, you know, along with epic, the highest form of literature, tragedy was traditionally written about upper class people. It was originally written about ancient heroes uh, in Shakespeare's time. Um, nearly all the tragedies are focused on kings and nobles and dukes and generals. Um, the idea that the intense experience of tragedy can be felt by anybody, by the poor, by Margaret in the ruined cottage, by Michael the shepherd. Um, I mean, to us, it's it's self-evident um, that people who do not wear fine clothes can feel deeply. But in Wordsworth's time, it was often felt that was not a suitable subject for poetry. I did quite a lot of work writing the book on the, the reviews of Wordsworth. And the, the thing that the Tory reviewers, the conservative reviewers keep coming back to is the idea that somehow it is an affront to sensibility, to poetry, that Wordsworth should write about these vagrants and discharged soldiers. Um, you know, there's, there's, there's one review that sort of says, you know, he sh shouldn't be writing sympathetically about dis discharged soldiers because um, that's, that's, that's not patriotic in time of war. Um, you know, we, we, should, we should be celebrating everything to do with the army. Um, so I think if we go sort of back into the time, yes, he, he is sincere about that. Having said that, um, the, you know, there's a great debate about exactly at what point in his life Wordsworth ceased to be a radical. Um, and uh, there is also a sense in which the, the sort of the danger with Wordsworth's way of writing about his, his encounters on the road um, is that there can appear to be a kind of condescension there. Um, and uh, for, for me, uh, I, I think my answer to this question is, Yes, we should absolutely read and respect um, what Wordsworth did in those poems and how, how novel it was, what he was trying to do. But we should also recognize that he is writing from the point of view of someone um, who came from the middle classes. Yes, he had financial problems, but he went to a bloody good grammar school. He got a Cambridge education. Um, so as well as reading Wordsworth, we must also read John Clare. John Clare, my other great romantic poet of nature. Edward Thomas, the wonderful First World War poet, said of Clare, no one has ever written so well about the life of the farm, the life of agricultural labor, um, who, what, who from, from the point of view of how it was experienced, as opposed to how it was looked at over a five barred gate. And there is an aspect of Wordsworth where he's he's looking on over a five barred gate. You know, he's he's there, particularly in the excursion. I think he's sort of wandering and talking. He's not actually getting his hands dirty. John Clare had to get his hands dirty because he was an agricultural labourer himself. So we do need him as a kind of balance. And once we bring him into the picture, then yes, romanticism is absolutely um, acknowledging the hierarchy of sensibility. Just picking up on the on the slave slavery one, I, I think there um, the key thing to remember from the point of view of Wordsworth um, is his great friendship with and respect for Thomas Clarkson. And of course, when the abolition bill is finally passed, he's passed, he, he writes this great sonnet to Clarkson. The slave trade would not have been abolished, but for the work of Thomas Clarkson writing his book traveling the land, lecturing, using objects, picking up on Jeff's point. Do you remember that uh, Clarkson would, mm. would take with him to his public lectures some of the terrible instruments um, that were used on the slave ships? And Wordsworth's moment of homage to Clarkson, I think, is of, is of great importance. And of course, he wrote a sonnet in homage to Toussaint Louverture. So I was pretty angry with the National Trust for putting the Cockermouth birthplace um, on their blacklist um, on the grounds that um, Brother John's uh, East India man 
was involved in imperial trade. And it is true that had Brother John not been shipwrecked, um, he would have picked up a, a load of opium in India, sold it on to China and come back with, a, with a, a steady fortune for the Romantics. But we remember that house as Wordsworth's birthplace. And Wordsworth, like Coleridge, um, was a passionate believer in abolition. So I think that was a, that was a bad move by the National Trust. Yeah, I think it's, I mean, your book is very good on, on children. And if I'm correct, the words were named Thomas and Catherine after the Clarksons, then they, they named their two children. So, you know, what greater tribute could there be? Either I should have said that in the book. Thank you. Thank you very much. Second, second edition. I, I, just coming back as well to the five bar gate. I mean, I think that's a, that's a fantastic figure for thinking about that. But I also have the sense that Wordsworth is always aware of that, isn't he? And he's always informing the reader of his awareness of the possible distance between him and the, the worker in the field. We think of a poem like Resolution and Independence. It's sort of almost comic, isn't it? In, in, the, in the sort of degree of self-parody where in acknowledging initially the failures to understand and listen properly to the stories that, that he's being, being told. And for me, that's one of the sort of the powers of Wordsworth is that that degree of kind of self-consciousness that he's he's always worrying about the things that you know critics or readers themselves will worry about. No, that's 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 absolutely right. But, you know, there is we have this image of 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 Wordsworth as this very sort of solemn figure taking himself very seriously. But actually, um, you know, there are tremendous moments of 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 self-parody um, in him, um, and. Uh, Certainly, both the encounter with the leech gatherer in Resolution and Independence and the little girl in We Are Seven, it's the other character who comes out of it best, not, not Wordsworth himself. Um, that said, of course, he, he, he was susceptible to parody. Um, and this is where the sort of the problem of the, the, the some of the later poems comes comes on. You know, when when he starts, you know, writing, a, addressing a poem to the spade of a friend. Um, and I talk quite a bit in the book about um, the way that his poem Peter Bell, um, uh, where a, a man is cruel to a donkey and then is sort of punished for it. Um, he kind of left it too late to publish it, but maybe if he had published it back at the time of lyrical ballads, um, it would have it would have struck a chord. But by the time he got around to publishing it, um, it was terribly susceptible to parody. So much so that um, John Keats's friend J. H. Reynolds wrote a parody of it before it was published, and uh, people actually sort of struggled to tell the difference between the parody and the poem itself. <laughs> Just going back to the. Sorry, John. Let me just go back to the original question about words of sincerity, uh, as it were, uh, in people outside his, his circle. He does, doesn't he, make that uh, remarkably strong defence in that letter to John Wilson, who, who complains that, that the poem about the disabled boy is not a fit subject for poetry. And what he basically says, doesn't he, is we've got to look outside our immediate bubble, which is a, a kind of thing we might be doing now. And he said people in our rank in life are perpetually falling into one sad mistake, namely that are supposing that human nature and the persons they associate with are one and the same thing. So you, you have to, it, if, if people don't know it, it's a letter to read. Um, and yeah. if, if anybody hasn't read it, I'd be very happy to send a, a reply by email um, because it, it is worth studying. The other great moment, of course, where in a sense he, he learns that, that act of empathy with the poor is the extraordinary passage in the prelude where he remembers being down in the Loire Valley with Michel Beaupuy, this uh, uh, general who's fighting on the radical side and they're walking together and talking and they see this hunger bitten girl leading a heifer by a piece of string and at the same time knitting. And Beaupuy points it out this image of poverty and says, it is against that that we are fighting. Mm -hmm. So the, the, perhaps time um, for another a question um, from uh, one of the attendees. Um, this is from Pam Gould, and it's uh, in the, the Child is Father to the Man, you say that Wordsworth and the Romantic poets were influenced by Rousseau's idea of the child as born innocent, in a state of nature, but corrupted by contact with society. Rousseau and Locke before him believed that rational thought was a prerequisite to moral understanding, and the child did not develop rational thought sufficient to understand abstract moral concepts until the age of 12. 
Yet in Wordsworth, spots of time, recollections from early childhood, such as the nest robbing episode, it's the abstract moral lessons that he learns from nature. Do you th think, do you think that this is a point on which the romantic child diverges from the Rousseauian child? It's a very interesting question. I mean, I, I think one thing to remember about Wordsworth is that he, he wasn't um, a systematic intellectual in the way that Coleridge was. Um, he did read widely, but he, he, he tended to sort of pick and choose from uh, the, uh, the Enlightenment thinkers that he read, ra rather than to, to sort of, as it were, sign up to, to their thinking systematically. Um, it's interesting though you, 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 you speak of Rousseau sort of talking about the age of 12, because in many ways for Wordsworth, it's around about the age of 12 that um, he imagines us losing that kind of unified, integrated relationship with nature. Um, I talk quite a bit in the book about the various versions of the wonderful poem, There Was a Boy, You Knew Him Well, Your Cliffs and Owls of Winanda. Um, the boy blowing mimic hootings to the silent owls. And then in the moment when the owls don't reply, the whole of the visible scene entering unawares into the boy's mind. Mm. And one of the great pleasures actually when I was making the radio programs was to look at the original manuscript of that poem uh, at, uh, in, in the Jerwood collection. And we see how Wordsworth originally writes this poem about himself, but then he changes it from I to he and says the boy died when he was 10 years old. He later revises it to 12 years old. And there's a sense that although probably at some level he was thinking about a fellow schoolboy who died, there is a sense in which that poem is about himself dying into adolescence, that as a child, the whole of nature enters unawares into our mind. We are at one with nature. But then once self-consciousness comes along, then we're divided from it. Mm -hmm. So I think my answer to the question would be that that sense of learning the moral truth from nature, finding you know, morals in trees and stones, um, is actually something that the adult imposes on the childhood memory. Right. I don't, I'm not sure that I think, but I believe that at the moment of clinging on to the, 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 the cliff edge when he's in, in the bird's nesting scene, the, the egg catching scene, um, the, the, at that moment, Wordsworth is having a kind of uh, a, a moral vision. He's probably just hanging on for dear life. Um, but it, it's in retrospect, it, it's the point I was making earlier about the way yeah. in which the very act of remembering is the thing that gives meaning to the memory, which is rather like the point Jeff was making about objects being given meaning by the people who perceive them. But a very, very, very good question. One of the, the great poems of memory, of course, is, is I Wandered Lonely. Um, and uh, the, the joy that that can give us in, in years to come. And there's a question from Tim Robertson, Robins, Robertson. The Daffodils poem is a cliche to those of us who are over 50 but most younger people have never heard of it. Is it a masterpiece to which we should we now return our attention? Well, it's a great question. And it's great to have Tim um, in, on, in, in on the discussion. Um, yeah, it's a tricky one, isn't it? Because um, when we made the radio programs, um, I said to my fantastic producer, B.T. Rubens, I said, I've got one condition for these programs that we don't mention the daffodils. <laughs> because that's what everybody immediately thinks. You say Wordsworth, you think daffodils. And of course, the demographic of Radio 4, for whom I was making the programmes, is indeed predominantly people over 50. So I wanted them to find out about things like the Re Wordsworth and the French Revolution, which you know, a surprising number of people don't actually know that Wordsworth literally walked into the French Revolution. Mm -hmm. But I think Tim makes a very good point, doesn't he, that the, the falling away of the study of poetry um, in schools means that Daffodils is not known um, to, 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 to many young people. And in that sense, it can be um, a, a wonderful way of, 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 of getting into Wordsworth. And certainly I find it um, a tremendously valuable poem to teach because of course we have Dorothy's journal entry where she describes them walking in Galbarrow Park by Lake Earlswater and describes the movement of the daffodils and then we know that Wordsworth wrote the poem sometime later. And so the fact, uh, this really helps you to see that a poem is always a, 
a reconstruction, a mediation of experience, not a direct record of it. A poem is not a diary. I wandered lonely as a cloud. Well, you didn't because Dorothy was with you. Um, whether he was actually lying on his couch remembering the daffodils, who knows, who cares? The point about the poem is that as we lie on our couches, we can be inspired by the vision of the daffodils. So it's a, um, it, it is a poem absolutely that um, uh, you know, we, should, we, 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 we should celebrate. Um, and it, it's good also, um, I see on the shelf behind Jeff, a great row of the great Cornell edition. I think that's what it is behind you anyway. Yeah. Um, the Cornell edition of all Wordsworth's poems and their, their manuscripts. And it's, it, it's fascinating me looking at the evolution of his manuscripts. No poet revised his work more than Wordsworth. And so of course it's intriguing that he, he didn't actually originally call it Daffodils. Um, it was only um, when he was revising it for his 1815 collected poems that he scribbled Daffodils um, uh, on, onto the um, onto the notebook and we don't even know if that was meaning I intend to call it daffodils or just like a reminder to himself this is the one about the daffodils so mm -hmm. um so it, it, it is a it's a it is a it's a great teaching poem as well as a you know a fantastic observation of nature and a fantastic memory also worth adding in relation to kind of my claims about Wordsworth the poet who changed the world um we need to remember that one of the earliest purchases um, of the National Trust was uh, the field by Lake Earlswater, where Wordsworth and Dorothy saw the daffodils. Uh, there was a rumor going around the Lake District, it was gonna be sold off to a developer to put up holiday villas there. And at this point, good old Canon Rawnsley and his friends all got together and made sure um, that it was bought and uh, that it was part of the Brandlehow estate, but it was bought and preserved for the nation. Hannah, if you're there, uh, there is another question that I, has just gone off my screen. Okay, I've got it, Jeff. Shall I ask? Could you do that? Um, Thank you. Um, well, I've, I've got a couple, but I mean, one of the things that comes across from the book, Jonathan, and also comes across very much in hearing you talk, is just the sense of uh, excitement uh, about Wordsworth and about the poetry, which is obviously fantastic. Uh, you know, and even they're talking about daffodils, um, a kind of. Uh, 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 an account of the poem that makes us want to to go back to it and see, see it afresh and it's about this that um adam lines has asked really he so adam says uh you talk in your introduction about wanting to write a book about wordsworth that would inspire and engage young students do you recall the moment when you were first excited by wordsworth yeah i mean i, I think so two 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 moments really. Um, one, uh, as I mentioned, um, or perhaps Simon mentioned that the uh, I talk a bit about in the preface to the book about the just the experience of going to the Lake District and going to Dove Cottage um, and seeing the way that this poet was so rooted in this this extraordinarily beautiful resonant place. Um, in terms of the actual poetry itself, um, like many people who sort of end up kind of devoting their lives to literature, I had great teachers at school. Um, and uh, it, 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 well, I can't remember exactly which year it was at school, but we were, we were essentially being trained in the art of close reading. Um, and uh, it, it was uh, resolution and independence that was, that was put in front of us. And um, the teacher sort of said, you know, uh, this, this is a poem about meeting an old man standing in a pond with leeches sucking blood out of his legs. And, you know, for sort of 16 year old boys, you think, that sounds a bit grisly. I like the sound of that. Um, and then from there, the, the teacher gave us this wonderful exposition um, of uh, the way that Wordsworth takes this apparently trivial subject and makes it into such a profound meditation about human endurance. Right, so there, there you are, Adam. If you if you don't know that poem already, that may be one to go off and look at as well. Resolution uh, and independence. Maybe I can I can be greedy and have another que another question, um, which is during the online course, people became absolutely fascinated by the relationship between Wordsworth and Samuel Taylor Coleridge, and in many ways that seems to structure your book. You mentioned earlier it's the kind of pivot moment. You you begin with it um, and then sort of the second half 
uh, happens when or comes in when the relationship starts to come apart. I mean, many people were interested by the um, the way in which it is uh, sort of initially supportive and stimulating and leads to these, this incredible burst of creativity. But they're also quite concerned, I think it's fair to say, about the, the ultimate, what they saw as the ultimate sort of destructiveness of um, the relationship. And a number of them sort of felt that, you know, Wordsworth comes out of this okay, it's been to his benefit, but the Coleridge sort of suffers uh, as a result of this uh, encounter um, with the figure who's initially been the more minor poet, but has during the period of the relationship has gone on to become, um, as far as they're concerned, the, the more significant. So I think that our, our, our learners and our attendees to, tonight would be very interested to get your take on that dynamic. Yeah, I think one of, for me, one of the key kind of lessons of writing biography is that you should always seek to explain and not to blame. Um, this I kind of learned writing the life of Ted Hughes, where everybody who's written about Ted Hughes and Sylvia Plath in the past seems to have taken one side or the other. And I worked so hard in that book not to ascribe blame. And of course, the Ted Hughes-Sylvia Plath relationship is curiously like the words of Coleridge. I talk a little about this in the book, the sense of two, two poets who were, you know, coming along as poets, but not that special. And then when they mesh together, they both mesh into greatness. Um, so yeah, avoiding blame. I mean, I think it's absolutely right that the, you know, the period of great poetry for them both was the period when, when they were close friends. I begin the book with uh, actually an, another footstepping experience. I was interested that when Wordsworth read the prelude to Coleridge um, over the 12 nights of Christmas, 1806 to seven, if they weren't in the Lake District or the West Country, they were in Leicestershire. So I thought I'd go along um, to have a look, see if the farmhouse is still there, Hall Farm, where they read it. And I was very lucky because um, it, it was up for rent. Um, so I pretended that I was interested in taking a 12 month lease on this farmhouse just by the M1 in Leicestershire. I was able to have a good poke around and just to stand in the very room where they sat those winter nights and Wordsworth read the prelude and then Coleridge wrote that extraordinary poem um, describing how at the end he just knelt in prayer and felt this was perhaps the great, certainly the greatest poem since Milton's Paradise Lost, possibly the greatest poem ever written by an Englishman. But of course it was that same Christmas that Coleridge had the experience or possibly the illusion, delusion of seeing Wordsworth in bed with, with Sarah. Um, I don't think they were up to anything naughty. Um, I think they were just working together because it was cold, but Coleridge became paranoid about this. And that was the beginning of the end of the relationship. And then of course, it all got worse when Basil Montague's father passed on some gossip about Coleridge being so difficult to live with because of his alcoholism and opium addiction. And I think anybody who's lived with an alcoholic or a family member or close friend dealing with drug addiction knows it is difficult living with these people. So it's not surprising Wordsworth said that. Um, but in the end, you know, there was a kind of toughness, a self-preservation about Wordsworth. And I think he realized that just to survive as a human being, he needed to detach himself from Coleridge. In later years, Coleridge was immensely forgiving, but the sad thing is neither of them really recovered their muse. After that split, um, Coleridge you know, becomes a fascinating thinker, a great lecturer on literature. He writes this extraordinary book, The Biography of Literaria, becomes a philosopher, a theologian, but his later poetry, like Wordsworth's, again, you struggle to find a late poem that sticks in the memory the way that Ancient Mariner or Kublai Khan or Frost at Midnight do. What's really interesting listening to these conversations is thinking of the new museum um, and that many of the things that you've talked about, Jonathan, will, will be featuring. And one of them is the letter in 1812 that Coleridge writes to Wordsworth and more or less says, you know, how could you ever have doubted me? Um, and that's a great thing. Also, of course, uh, you have just noticed the owls behind me, um, because there was a boy passage will also be in the new museum, and so too will, will the skates that we've seen. But we're sort of drawing towards a, a close, and um, we thought it would be a, a wonderful way to end. If you could read for us, please, Jonathan, um, why should we care about words of today, that, that paragraph? Um, I know you'll know which page it's on, but... Uh, <laughs> Well, I'll just say before I, I read this and um, click my, my leave meeting button, just thank you so much to everybody for attending, for, for, for supporting Dove Cottage. 
um, for, for you know, and, and for those and for, for those, those those great questions. Um, I was originally scheduled to to do a talk um, in Grasmere when the book came out, and alas, of course, that couldn't happen because of lockdown. I do hope it will happen next year, and we we really wish. Um, everybody at Dove, Dove Cottage, um, all the best, um, and very excited for the, the reopening of the museum next year. So this is um, from towards the end of the book, where I kind of asked the question, why should we still care about Wordsworth today? Why should we still care about Wordsworth today? Because he reminds us that we need to care for our children and to cherish a child's way of looking at the world because he wrote with unprecedented sympathy for the poor, the excluded, and the broken. Because his poetry has been for many, and can still be for some, a medium of solace and an oasis of calm in a noisy and stressful world, even a medicine for mental illness. Because his elegiac poetry can speak to us when we are bereaved. Because he expressed humankind's longing for the infinite and our sense of something far more deeply interfused, the oceanic feeling in a way that was not dependent on religious dogma. Because he changed the way we perceive, inhabit and preserve the wilder places of the natural world. But above all, on our fragile planet and with our uncertain ecological future, because at the very beginning of the industrial era that scientists have christened the Anthropocene, he foresaw that among the consequences of modernity would be not only the alienation of human beings from each other, but also potentially irretrievable damage to the delicate balance between our species and our environment. We preserve the things that we value. We will not save that which we do not love with this in mind, we might do well to attend to the title of the eighth book of the prelude, Retrospect, Love of Nature Leading to Love of Mankind. Well, that's what, that's what gets us up and makes us come to work at the Wordsworth Trust. It's, it's inspirational and you, it's been put perfectly. Thank you so much. Just before you do go, um, if I may say, um, just to say, please, uh, if you can, join us on the 22nd. Um, that, the, an, another great biography this year by Stephen Gill uh, we'll be discussing with Stephen. Can I thank Hannah enormously for, for steering us? It seems to have gone pretty perfectly, technical-wise and question-wise. Simon, thank you so much for co-hosting. It's been a great pleasure talking with you about this book. We, we've had some great discussions, um, and, and we've learned a lot, a, a great deal by doing it. Um, Obviously, we encourage you to buy the book. Um, we can't sell it online because, because of furloughs. We haven't got the systems in place, but independent bookshops everywhere uh, certainly will be able to supply it. Um, but just to thank you, I don't know how we do a round of applause on a webinar. I've never done it before. So you have to imagine 70 people clapping in their, in their kitchens and bedrooms and sitting rooms. Um, you, you talked about Richard Holmes sort of helping to get you into the head of Shelley. Well, your book's going to do that for so many people too, for, for words with. And uh, that question about uh, inspiring and engaging new students, well, it'll inspire and engage people of any age, students of any age, readers of any age, and beginners. And, and let's hope that when we get the new museum, when we get Dove Cottage and the whole thing together, that your book will be the, one of those many books that people will buy and build on their learning. So I don't know how we do it, but I'm going to give you a round of applause from Grasmere and let everybody do the same from wherever they are. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. All the best. Stay safe. Stay <laughs> Anna, have you any final words? No, thank you to everyone for being lovely. Thank you for tuning in from all over the world. Thank you for putting up with me when I took over the webinar. And please do share your thoughts and feelings and favourite parts of this webinar with us, whether it's by email or if you're on Twitter, tweet them at us at Wordsworth Graph because we'd love to hear from you. Thank you, Hannah. Who's got the leave meeting button? Have you got that or have I got that? I have it too. So I can, I will, I will end the meeting. Thank you, Thanks Jonathan. Thanks everybody for coming and good night. Good night, everybody.